Well, in neighbouring Algeria, the country's Prime Minister has claimed the bloody four-day siege of a gas plant was led by a Canadian Islamist gunman. Abdul Malak Selal said 37 foreign workers were killed and seven are still missing. One Algerian worker also died. 29 of the militants who attacked the plant died and three were captured. Here, David Cameron said Britain would offer counter-terrorism and intelligence aid to help dismantle the Islamist network which carried out the attack. Our foreign affairs correspondent, Jonathan Rugman, reports. The Algerians say 37 foreign workers died and seven are still missing at this plant in the desert. Islamist militants having apparently driven here from the Libyan border some 50 miles away. Among six dead Britons was 59-year-old Kenneth Whiteside from Fife. His brother heard the news from another worker at the plant who saw the militants shoot him. It was when the Algerian army decided to go in gung-ho the first assault, that the first thing they did was lined up four hostages, one being Kenny, and executed them. So, why, I don't know, but that's what they did. Two more British names have also been made public. 46-year-old Paul Morgan, a former British and French Foreign Legion soldier, he reportedly died defending workers leaving on a bus and 49-year-old Gary Barlow. His family said he had loved life and lived it to the full and that they were totally devastated. The Prime Minister talked of British intelligence forming part of an international effort, but there was no suggestion of British soldiers you, countering Speaker. the growing North African Speaker, threat. Like As it escalates, it is also becoming a magnet for jihadists from other countries who share this poisonous ideology. Indeed, there are already reports of non-Algerian nationals involved in this attack. We must tackle this poisonous thinking at home and abroad and resist the ideologue's attempt to divide the world into a clash of civilizations. There's no known British link with the men who wielded these weapons, but the Algerians say documents belonging to two Canadian citizens were found among the jihadist clothing. The Algerians say most of the men were from six North African countries, but that a Canadian citizen helped coordinate the attack. The group used to communicate with a website in Mauritania. The man who spoke to them was named Shaddad, and he is a Canadian national. He was talking in English, and his words were clear. But the Algerians say the commander of the attack was Al Taher Abu Aisha, an Algerian. They say they killed when the plant was stormed. His boss is believed to be Mokhtar Bel Mokhtar, and this Algerian has appeared in a new video, claiming the operation was in revenge for French strikes in Mali. And the hunt is now on for another Algerian jihadist, Abdul Hamid Abu Zaid. This video of him is dated on Christmas Day. The Algerian press claims that Abu Zaid, filmed here in Mali, used his relatives to get jobs as drivers at the Algerian plant. Abu Zaid has also admitted that he holds French hostages. And it's believed he ordered the killing of Edwin Dyer, a British hostage who was seized during a holiday to Mali in 2009. An American embassy cable from that year, released by WikiLeaks, reveals the impact of Dyer's execution on British thinking. A British diplomat is quoted as saying that a UK budget crunch has meant a reduced UK presence and less UK programming in West Africa but that Dyer's death had been a game-changer, refocusing UK attention on the security issues in the region. It was that killing of a Briton in 2009 which really put the Maghreb on the British intelligence map. But the French have traditionally taken the lead reporting back on the region. There's no known history of Britons going to fight with Islamists in this vast and ungoverned space. And British officials say militants from Pakistan, Afghanistan and Yemen still pose a greater threat to Britain itself. France has particularly strong ties with countries like Mali. It doesn't make sense for us all to double up in the same places. But in the Commons this afternoon, sure MPs questioned whether the Prime Minister's budget cuts meant he could really afford what he had described as a strong security response. As coffins emerge from the Algerian desert, British policy seems bound to change there, but quite by how much still isn't clear.
Jonathan Rugman, and for the latest on David Cameron's statement to MPs, our political editor Gary Gibbon is in Westminster. Gary, uh, so did the Prime Minister row back on uh, some of this sort of everlasting war rhetoric that was happening at the weekend? He didn't use the same rhetoric he used at the weekend, but he used some other pretty feisty stuff. He talked about a generational struggle. He ruled out the idea of containment. The uh, forces in the, uh, in the Maghreb must be overcome. There was some pretty strident stuff in there, but as Jonathan was saying, you don't get a sense of any major strategic shift in the deployment of British forces. There will be all sorts of hush-hush operations, things we won't get to hear about. There could be additional deployment to help the French in the area with some uh, extra planes, perhaps uh, some surveillance material, again, that won't be heavily publicised, I suspect. But in terms of the actual troops that we might send there, at the moment the plan is to send something in the region of tens of troops to help out perhaps with an EU training mission uh, to other militaries in the area so they can contain the jihadist threat. Nothing beyond that. And I think there is a slight mismatch. People came out of the chamber scratching their heads a little bit between the rhetoric, perhaps, that David Cameron is still using, even if it is a little bit reined in from the stuff at the weekend, uh, and the reality of what will change on the ground. Gary Gibbon at Westminster.